Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are currently in the book of Psalms. We come today to Psalm 104, and we resume our study in verse 25. So get your Bible, open it up to Psalm 104. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Continue studying the Word of God at your pace, at your convenience, verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. Check it out because there's nothing more important than the Word of God. Jesus said, God said, that he has exalted his Word even above his own name. And so study the Word of God with me using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. It'll change your life because it's the Word of God. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 104, verse 20. Let's go back to verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. True. Gold, silver, precious jewels. Honestly, I don't, I don't know why these things have value. I've never been able to figure that out because I guess I wouldn't mind having the, the money that, uh, that they're worth, but um, to have gold and silver and jewels, I don't know. I must be missing something. Um, I, evidently, God likes it, you know, because when he describes the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, which will be there forever, when eternity begins. Um, there's a lot of decorations made of uh, different precious stones and gold and stuff. So he puts value in them. Um, anyway, the earth sure is filled with, you gotta dig for it, but they're there. They're there, all sorts of riches, all sorts of valuable things. And, and that's just that kind of stuff. You're, you're talking about oil and coal and fossil fuels and wood and I mean, all sorts of things that we need, medicines, herbs, you know, for healing, food. Man, it's just, the earth is packed full of stuff that God has made for us. Amazing. He didn't skimp, did he? I mean, he made earth for man, primarily. Well, he made it for the animals to enjoy it too, but then he gave it to man to rule over, and, um, and he stuffed it with everything that we need to maintain our existence here in this world. And then he says in verse 25, So is this great and wide sea wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. Nothing illustrates the wonder of God and the fact that he loves variety any more than the seas. Isn't that true? The variety of creatures from massive to tiny, all of different shapes and all of different sizes are mind-boggling. And then, you know, I think I, I saw a documentary a while back on, uh, <clears throat> you know, there are parts of the oceans that are whatever. I think the deepest part I read was like about six, seven miles deep. Anyway, for, for years, uh, people thought that there was just too much pressure. Nobody could, nothing could exist in that deepest part of the ocean. But somehow they've gone down there um, with some sort of devices that would not be crushed. And lo and behold, they have found some very strange looking living creatures who God has created to adapt to that kind of pressure. Bizarre looking creatures. But, you know, it's just another example of the great variety. God loves variety. And uh, the ocean creatures, the sea creatures, certainly illustrate that. 26, there go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. This, this verse has always just blessed me. Leviathan. 
refers to a very large sea creature. I don't think anybody knows exactly what it was or maybe is. I don't know. It's just a very large, a huge sea creature. And I love this part. God says that he made the ocean for Leviathan to play in. You don't think about God making an ocean for a fish to play in or a sea creature to play in, do you? But he did. Um, Leviathan, I suppose, is sort of like one of God's pets. And evidently, the Lord enjoys watching him play. So he made him a big pond to play in, splash around and do whatever he does for fun. I don't know. But, you know, it's kind of, kind of a neat thing about God <clears throat> because especially puppies and little animals, young animals, you know, baby animals, I mean, they all like to play, don't they? I don't know if snakes like to play. Probably not. But, you know, other than that, animals and evidently fish like to play somewhat. Just like human beings when they're little. They like to play. I remember going to a, to a zoo many years ago. And there are all sorts of people um, surrounding this, this one part of the zoo. And I thought, what's going on over there? And I went there and I, and I looked and I found out there were two tiny little cubs, bears, black bears, just little. They looked like puppies. And they were just having a great time together. They were playing and playing and everybody was having a ball watching them. And evidently, that's how God is. You know, he's more like us in those ways than sometimes I think we even care to imagine or think of. Um, we're created in his, in his image and his likeness. And, you know, he, he evidently uh, likes to watch his creatures play. He has that, that's entertainment for him. Um, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but that seems to be what the Bible teaches. It won't surprise me. It's, and, but you know what? To me, that says volumes about God and just how he is. He's great God, isn't he? He's, he's not only the kind of God that you love because of all that he has done for us, especially dying on the cross to pay for our sins, but he's, the, he's such an easy God to like. He's such a likable God. Verse 27. There I'll wait upon thee, that thou mayest give them their food in due season. The animals are content getting what they need from God when they need it. Isn't that a lesson for us? The animals are content in just getting what they need from God when they need it. And no human should expect any more from God than that. To expect more than what we need is really to make an idol out of whatever it is that we want. God often gives us more than what we need, but we should be content just having what we need. Notice verse 28. It says, That which thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good. Thank the Lord that he meets all of our needs with an open hand. It is true that like the animals, we have to work. They have to gather. That's what the Bible says here. They, they can't just wait. God's not going to you know, drop whatever they need in their nest as they sit there relaxing in the sun. They have to go out, they have to gather. So it is true that like animals, we have to work. But in the working, God provides. If he ever closed his hand of provision, everyone and everything would starve. 29. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Hide your face means ignore. All living things depend on God paying attention to them. God must be involved. Nothing runs on automatic. The creator is also the sustainer. If he would ever ignore us, we would die on the spot. 
to begin with, our atoms would split. And you know what would happen then? It'd be it. It'd be all over. Bang. Verse 29 again. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. Nothing and no one dies until God takes away their breath. God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And God does not remove that breath until he says it's time for that one to die. And when it is time, nothing can stop it from happening. Verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. God created everything through the Holy Spirit. He renews, he renews the face of the earth by his spirit as well. So he created everything and he renews everything, both by his spirit. And he renews it every spring. At least around here you can see it. Everything is gray, everything is white, everything is frozen. It's pretty dead for December, January, February, sometimes part of March, sometimes all of March around here. It's, it's just white, it's gray, it's dead. The branches are brittle. There are no flowers, there are no birds. Once in a while you see a stray squirrel. But then, usually toward the end of March, middle of March, if you're lucky, everything starts to unthaw. And maybe the branches start to get a little softer. Sap starts to run again. There's a little more sunlight, you know. And things start to slowly but surely come alive again. And it is God renewing creation, just like clockwork. And he says he's going to do that. He made the promise. He is going to do that. There's going to be summer and harvest and winter and what am I in my, yeah, winter and spring. Those four things, they're not going to cease for as long as the earth endures. Verse 31. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. God rejoices in his creation. I would too if I was him. He enjoys it. See, there's another way that we are sort of like God. I mean, there's another example of being created in his image. He rejoices in his work. He does a good job. And he takes satisfaction in it. And the reason people feel good about a job well done is that we were created in God's image. Man was created to work. Man was not created to sit at home and collect a welfare check and do absolutely nothing and make a living by doing that, by doing nothing. That's not, that is not God's will. It is God's will for man to do whatever work they are capable of doing. And it's a good feeling to do our best and to see our work done well. I can remember <clears throat> my dad had a one-man sign shop and my two older brothers used to help him, um, you know, put up signs and stuff like that. And then I got to be about 11 years old, and I started helping. I just started holding the ladder. And then I did other things. But one of the things that I remember about my dad is after he finished a job, he would always, he would always before he put the ladders away and everything, he would step back. He'd, he'd step back maybe, you know, 30 feet from the sign, and he'd just look at it. And he never said anything, but he'd look at it. He'd, he'd look at it, check it out, make sure everything looked good. And you can tell, without saying anything, he took satisfaction in his work. And that's what God does. He steps back, he looks at creation, he says, that looks pretty good. I like it. Everything I made is good. And he gets satisfaction out of it. We need to work, and we need to do our best. And we need to take pride in the work 
that we have done if it's done well, if it's done to the best of our ability. And when I say pride, I'm not talking about sinful pride. Of course, acknowledging that God is the one who gave us the ability to do that, and he deserves all the credit. But it's still a good feeling to know that God has worked through you to do something, to accomplish something. That's a good feeling. That's how we're created. We're created to experience that. 32. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He touches the hills, and they smoke. God can trigger an earthquake with a little glance. I mean, actually, he doesn't even need that. And he certainly does not need a fault in the earth's crust. And right, and this is going to be this is going to come to pass. There's no question about it. Right before Jesus returns, he's going to cause the entire earth to quake. The Bible says every island, every mountain, every valley will experience an earthquake. And God tells us these things ahead of time because He wants sinners who refuse to repent to know who they are dealing with and to know what they will experience. Verse 33, I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. The writer says, God is my God, meaning I know him. He knows me. I'm his. He's mine. And that's the way he prays God. And that's why he prays God, because God was his God. When you know God, you're going to praise God. You can't help but praise God. And the more we submit to God, the better we will know him, and the more we will want to praise him. It just builds on itself. That's, that's why I, I see absolutely no reason for any Christian to be lukewarm. I don't think a Christian can be lukewarm not for a long period of time, without repenting. I think that contradicts Scripture in 1 John. But beyond that, I don't see any reason for a Christian to want to be lukewarm. Maybe you just you miss out on everything. You miss out on all the good that comes from fellowshipping with God and being close to Him. Verse 34, My meditation of Him shall be sweet, I will be glad in the Lord. Boy, it is fun to be glad in the Lord. It is fun to rejoice in God. And actually, the door swings both ways. It's a good time when we praise God, and when we enjoy Him, He enjoys us. God enjoys us enjoying Him. The Bible says He rejoices over us. Verse 35, Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye. This guy is filled with the Spirit of Almighty God. Obviously, he's writing Scripture. I mean, he is praising God, and he's having a good time, and he's close to God. And in the midst of all this, he says, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth. Get rid of them. And I say amen to that, and so does God, and he's going to do it. You love your sin, you love your lukewarmness, you love, you love all that, you love life without God, well, then you just go ahead and get life without God. But not on his planet, not on his new earth, not in his new heavens. You enjoy life with God where you deserve, and that's the lake of fire. That's what you want, then you just go ahead and have that. But you're not going to mess up anybody else's life who loves God and wants to fellowship with Him and enjoy Him. And you're not going to mess up God either. Not forever. Not going to get away with it. So he says again in verse 35, Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Yeah. Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul, praise ye the Lord. And the best way to get rid of the wicked who are so bad that they don't even honor their creator and so bad that they rebel against the one who actually gave them life and gave them all the good things that they have. You know what the best way to get rid of them? 
Yeah, nuclear bomb. No, 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 no. The best way to get rid of all these wicked people who don't care about God is for those sinners to repent and become God-fearing people who love Jesus Christ and serve their Creator. That's the best way to get rid of God's enemies is to have them become God's friends. But that's up to them. That's God's preferred way. But if they don't take that preferred way, he's going to get rid of them the other way. And we all know what that means. Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. The world needs to hear who the real God is and what he has done and what he will do so that they, at least some of them, will leave their sin and their devotion to other so-called gods and serve the Lord God Almighty. I'm telling you, the world needs to hear the truth, the pure word of God, unwatered down. And I know, I know, I know, I know, it rubs people the wrong way. It steps on people's toes. They don't want to hear the stuff that bothers them. They don't want to hear the stuff that irritates them in their flesh because that's the only thing that the Word of God irritates is the flesh. If you get irritated from hearing the Word of God and somebody teaching it straight, then that is something in your flesh, in your sin nature that is being irritated because God doesn't irritate anything that's good. And I will tell you, the world needs to hear who the real God is and what He has done and what he will do. And he, they're not going to hear that unless somebody gives out the pure word of God. That's where it starts. Verse 2. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. People like to hear about supernatural things, don't they? Talk about all of his wonderful works. His wondrous works. People like that. You know why? It's because the Bible says that God has put eternity within the heart of man. We are more than just our physical bodies. We are more than just material beings. There is something deep down inside of us that is spiritual. It's our soul. And it longs for the supernatural. It's the most natural thing in the world. It's longing for God, who of course is supernatural. I remember one time I was teaching a Bible study and a guy refused to believe the supernatural things in the Bible because, and this was his reason. He said, well, that's just too supernatural. <laughs> I said, yeah. What do you think God is? People like to hear about supernatural things. Science fiction can be a pathetic substitute for spiritual things with some people. But it is. It's it's a way of them trying to scratch that supernatural itch. They don't want to submit to God. They don't want to think about the Word of God because they don't want to change their lifestyle. So they try to satisfy that supernatural itch by getting into science fiction. Well, you know what? Forget the science fiction, man. We who know the Lord have a whole book, book full of stories and, and, and probably some personal experiences concerning God who is supernatural. And it's more fun to talk about that stuff than the latest episode of whatever, Star Wars. I don't know. Verse 3. Glory ye in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice who seek the Lord. Glory in his holy name. And the name in scripture, remember this, the name in scripture refers to the person, the entire person, not just his title or his label. And so what he's saying is be happy that you have a God like God. Glory in his name. Be happy in the person of God. Be happy that you have a God like God. If you like good, you can't do better than Almighty God. He will never embarrass you by doing something wrong. 
He will never embarrass you by saying something foolish or stupid or wrong or bad. Verse 4. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek ye, seek his face evermore. It takes effort to, to seek something, right? Hide and seek. Play that as a kid. One of the people, one of the kids hides and the other ones have to seek. That means you have to go looking for them. You search, you work. It takes effort to seek something. It takes effort to seek God. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. It takes effort to seek God's face. It takes effort to draw close to God. It takes effort to pray hard. It takes effort to pray long and to read his word. But the rewards of your effort that you put into seeking God are tremendous. They're unmatched. When you seek him, and you just even begin to get a little taste of him, you're going to want to seek him even more. Forget about the work involved. Once you start getting a taste of God, it's not going to be work. It's going to be fun. Still be effort, but the joy that you experience in the midst of seeking God. You might get tired doing it, but you'll never get tired of doing it. Verse 5. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Memory is such a wonderful, such an amazing gift, isn't it? And our memory is best used when we remember our God, how good he is and what great things he has done. If we ever sense our devotion slipping away or our love for him wavering, then we should take the time to remember because soon we're going to be appreciating him again, probably more than ever. Verse 6, O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen, Talking about God's chosen people in the Old Testament, Israel. Christians in the New. If no, one, if no one else uses their memory to think about God, we who are being saved from hell sure should. He tells us to remember God. The world's not going to remember God. The world's too busy trying to forget God. Put God out of their mind, man. That's why they nailed Jesus to the cross. We've got to get rid of God. He's hampering our lifestyle. Remember when he cast all the, the, the demons out of that demon-possessed fellow in the land of uh, Decapolis? And he went into the pigs? And the, and the swine couldn't stand the demons being inside of them, so they ran uh, over, the, over a cliff and drowned? Remember that? The people who owned the pigs came out and told Jesus, get out, of their, get out of their land. Get out of here. They didn't want that. They didn't care that the, the man was delivered from demon possession, the only thing they cared about, they lost a lot of pork chops when their pigs died. Get out of here, Jesus. You're hampering our lifestyle. True. If we who know and love Jesus Christ don't think about God, if we don't talk about God, then no one will because everybody else in the world wants to forget about God, the one true God anyway. I'm out of time. Continue studying the Word of God at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click the book you want to study, click the chapter, open your Bible, and listen. Follow along as I teach it verse by verse. That's at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Study at your pace, at your convenience. And as you are studying, please remember that I'm not brought to you by any prayer or by any large church or denomination, but always and for the last 30 plus years by your prayers and financial support. This is a faith ministry. And so if you are blessed by the word of God and you want to help me get it out and stand shoulder to shoulder with me in this ministry, then I would appreciate you praying for me and praying for this ministry and also clicking the donate button at the top of the front page and prayerfully giving as the Lord may lead. Until next time, so long.